This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. For most of us, a critical factor in creating a sustainable and satisfying career is the formal education we acquire. In the development and aid space, a master's degree from a credible institution is really the minimum bar for even an entry-level position in any top-shelf organization. And access to this type of education and its benefits are things many of us simply take for granted. But what if your community were caught in the grips of conflict? Or what if you find yourself growing up in a camp for displaced people? Or what if higher education infrastructure just simply doesn't exist in your neck of the woods? My guest today for the 107th episode of the Terms of Reference podcast is Barbara Moser-Mercer. She is the founder and director of InZone, an initiative that pioneers innovative approaches to multilingual communication and higher education in communities affected by conflict and crisis by designing, developing, and scientifically validating learner-centered and technology-supported pedagogical models. Barbara is also a professor of conference interpreting at the University of Geneva, where her research focuses on cognitive neuroscience aspects of the interpreting process, the human performance dimension of skill development and expertise, and on pedagogical approaches to digital learning in fragile contexts. Barbara also co-developed the Virtual Institute, which is a virtual learning environment specifically designed for the acquisition of complex skills, which has been used by ICRC, ILO, UNHCR, and UNAMA for enhancing interpreting skills of interpreters working in conflict zones and to advance formal and non-formal higher education in emergencies. I spoke with Barbara in Lausanne, Switzerland. Hello, Barbara. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Good morning, Stephen. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Tell us, I know this because we've talked before this interview, but tell us where you're sitting right now. Well, right now I'm sitting at the École Polytechnique Fédérale in Lausanne, actually at the uh, UNESCO conference from Innovation to Social Impact, where InZone is presenting this afternoon on some of its innovative models in building higher education spaces in Mm -hmm. refugee contexts. I think it's so awesome. You're definitely the first guest we've had on the show that's actually at a conference presenting on what we're about to talk about. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm giddy with excitement. It's fantastic. Why don't you first start by telling us about the work that you've been doing recently with InZone, what InZone is, and, and how it contributes to the development in humanitarian aid community? Well, InZone actually started with a big question. How can people in conflict and crisis truly understand each other if there's only one language that's being spoken? So we started looking at the power of language and the language of power and realized that without some professional support in crossing the language barrier, there really was no way that people in humanitarian contexts would truly understand each other. So fast forward, having spent years improving the skills of humanitarian interpreters in conflict zones, we ultimately realized that the theories and the models that we had developed and the research that we'd done uh, could actually support more than professionalizing the humanitarian interpreting sector and that we could actually professionalize or build uh, innovative models for higher education emergencies. And I think uh, with the Syrian crisis, the whole idea of higher education and the importance of higher education as opposed to just primary and secondary education, which is provided for by international humanitarian law. So the importance of higher education has only really come to the fore during the Syrian refugee crisis. And that, I believe, has catapulted us a little bit onto the scene because we've been doing this now for quite some time and have some experience uh, to show and some research uh, that we've done that actually supported the models that we've been using. What was the fulcrum point of that brought higher education to the forefront? What was, what, was there a moment or is it just you know, the growing body of evidence that now it's the aha time or what was the factor there? Well, I think it's hard to put your finger on it exactly, but the way I see it is that higher education in Syria was fairly well developed, and that was not necessarily the case in the conflict zones in the Horn of Africa, let's say. So, you know, we already had a tradition of higher education there, and conflict in Syria really disrupted uh, the further development of higher education, and we had a, a large number of refugees who already had a certain background uh, had already started uh, to study and their studies were interrupted. So I think all of a sudden it became clear, well, you know, higher education also needs to be part of humanitarian action. 
Before I go down the, the other sort of rabbit hole of, of, your, of the innovative approaches you're using, something that strikes me as very interesting is that you've been doing interpretation and, and researching it and studying and teaching it for literally years and years and years. Can you just reflect on that for a second? Because many times we think of innovation coming out of an aha moment or coming out of many factors coming together at one point. Would you consider, you know, the end zone uh, an aha moment or would you consider that, hey, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and this is the next logical step or, or how did it actually happen for you? To be honest, there was an aha moment, uh, you know, very early on, early on in the sense that we were asked to train about 20 interpreters coming out of Baghdad. And this goes back to 2005. And when we only managed to get four out of there, uh, you know, coming to Geneva and to train them, it, it seemed, you know, absolutely logical to me that there had to be a better way of doing this and that the demand was so extraordinary um, that there would be no way we would ever be able to meet it by bringing people to Geneva. It kind of coincided with our building a virtual learning environment ourselves, applying the pedagogical theories that we firmly believed in and not finding anything, you know, off the shelf that would satisfy our requirements. So there was an aha moment in there. Uh, but beyond that, I think what I'd really, really like to talk about today is innovation not as, you know, a moment in time where all of a sudden everything comes together, but a series of, of uh, iterative steps of a combination of, of models and theories uh, that come together, an interdisciplinary approach to things that allows you to really broaden your vision uh, to such an extent that you s begin to see the connections. It's a little bit like, you know, looking at the brain and, you know, how synaptic transfer happens and how, you know, different areas of the brain light up all of a sudden and there's a confluence of insights that then create innovative models. That's a little bit how I would like to describe InZone. So not as, oh, you know, one day I wake up and, you know, I'm creative. Uh, I No, I wouldn't say so. But yeah, there was an original impetus indeed. Well, why don't you take us through that? I, you know, kind of take us through the evolution, the, how, those, how those pieces came together for Enzo. So the way the pieces actually came together was indeed, you know, starting from that aha moment and knowing what we did uh, already in terms of uh, how people learn, how people become experts, uh, how you develop skills how that can be supported uh, in the virtual environment. I would say a healthy mistrust of technology in general and, you know, reversing the tables on technology and saying, well, technology has to serve what we believe are good and sound pedagogical models and not the other way around. At the same time, we also realized that technology actually mediated new pedagogical models. So this interrelationship, I think, is for us at least a constant uh, challenge because we feel, yes, technology is moving so fast, but our pedagogical models aren't necessarily moving as fast as technology is. So we always, always have to be on our toes, you know, trying to reflect very carefully on what we do and how our learners uh, use technology in order to be able uh, to well, generate the very, very best uh, out of a situation that is indeed challenging in many ways. I think a solid understanding of how people learn, that basically is my background, you know, coming from cognitive psychology and having studied what probably counts as one of the most complex cognitive activities, and that's simultaneous interpretation. You know, you listen to a message in one language and you simultaneously have to uh, interpret that message into another language in real time. So you don't really have a lot of time thinking about, uh, you know, what does the person mean? You really have to anticipate. You always, always have to put yourself into the shoes of somebody else. And I think that is one of the foundations of Enzone. We never ever do anything without a true and solid understanding of those who we work with and for, in, to a large extent, refugees, what they think, what their understanding is of a situation. So I think that is one of the pillars of Enzone. And it comes, as I said, from this tradition of interpreting, of having to understand what somebody else says. But at the same time, staying neutral and staying impartial. That is another tenet of interpreting. You are not the one who creates the messages. No, you need to listen to somebody. You need to interpret those messages. And you need to have a fairly 
distanced look at what somebody says and making sure that you're not imposing your own opinions on what is being said. That, I think, has helped us immensely in trying to listen to people in conflict zones, in trying to develop approaches that we knew would be culturally appropriate, uh, would be linguistically appropriate, and would be appropriate in the humanitarian sense of not doing any harm, of making sure that everyone was actually engaged and involved in the process. That led us to, you know, the pedagogy of collaborative learning. We're not about parachuting courses into a refugee camp, but we're about um, ensuring that whatever materials we're using, uh, that these are relevant, that if possible, uh, they are co-developed, that the onus is actually on the learners to generate and to produce, you know, learning materials and the reports, that everything is transparent and open, that there is no competition, uh, because competition by definition generates conflict and generates the kind of perhaps even aggression that we, we want to avoid. And collaboration ultimately is a medium that we're using to encourage incidental learning about how do you resolve conflict? Well, you resolve conflict by collaborating. And if you've learned collaboratively, chances are it will become a habit. And if it becomes a habit, well, then we have actually instilled good practice for the future. So this is how some of the theories and models that we've been using, uh, you know, have come together. Perhaps one of the one of the important elements in all of this, uh, in trying to understand how people learn, is how people develop not just uh, basic skills, but how people develop expertise in what they do, and. Our study of expertise in interpreting has allowed us to understand just in general how people become experts. There's a whole body of research out there in various domains, starting from chess playing to piano playing to expert uh, expertise in, in any domain, in sports, in athletics, whatever. The process is always more or less the same. You know, the model and, you know, what does it mean to be an expert? And what does it take to be an expert? And I think this is really, you know, where we derive a lot of inspiration from simply because we've done quite a bit of the research, we've studied people developing high levels of expertise and those are the kinds of lessons that we feel you know, also need to be applied you know, in the humanitarian context that we are working in, especially in higher education. And I, I think you know, higher education is to some extent obviously different from primary and secondary education, although those two build the foundation for higher education, but I, I'm, I, I really feel in a way privileged that we as a university actor, you know, have come onto the scene and are trying to make a difference uh, in an area where we usually have only been present through research. Right now, you know, we feel we're big, trying to shape how universities become higher education, uh, humanitarian actors. That is rather a novel thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the role of higher education, yes, as I said, traditionally has been, you know, to do the research on refugees and on those contexts, whereas now, all of a sudden, we are smack in the middle of those contexts. We're right in the middle of a refugee camp. So, and yeah, actually, actually, give us, you know, that, the one thing that, that we haven't heard yet is, like, that tangible example or story. Like, tell, tell us about, you know, what, and what's the actual application, either in Syria or Baghdad or, or one of the places you're working right now. How does in-zone playing a role? What's actually going on? I think the role that we're playing is really trying to develop a model of higher education uh, that is both respectful of the humanitarian context in which we work, you know, being framed by the humanitarian print principles and the code of conduct, while at the same time uh, trying to bring the very best of what we know learning can be uh, to a context that is extremely challenging. So in order to do that, we obviously have to be right in the middle of it. And we did that by designing, and we do that by designing and developing what we call higher education spaces. And why do we call them higher education spaces? Because 
you don't just learn in front of a computer screen. And that was kind of the very narrow model of distant learning for refugees. Uh, yes, you know, just offer something online. You know, let them go online, mm -hmm. give them connectivity, and there's obviously no dearth of information, no dearth of knowledge to be had on the Internet, and all you need to do is make that access possible. Yes, we're saying the access is always important. You need to have access, you need to have connectivity, and that in itself is challenging. No matter, you know, how much technology we have available in the humanitarian sector, it is continues to be a challenge. But to us, that is not, you know, what higher education is all about. I think the strength of higher education is to allow people to acquire 21st century skills, the critical thinking, the reflecting upon what has happened to them and how they can actually work on improving their livelihoods. That, to me, is really what the essence of higher education is, and this is what we need to create an enabling environment in the most challenging context that will allow refugee learners to be able to engage in this kind of intellectual activity. And Indeed, we are challenging them, and we are not lowering the standards. No, we're taking regular courses, but we're adapting uh, and contextualizing those courses so that they become relevant and meaningful uh, for those learners, while at the same time, you know, pulling them up and making sure that they themselves feel they are improving their skills and that they are not in any way getting any kind of education uh, at a discount so that, you know, the requirements would be the same because that is exactly what they want and rightly so. So do they, do students come out of your program with, with degrees, diplomas, certificates or? Right. Uh, so I think, you know, given our background, obviously, uh, the progression that we've developed for training humanitarian interpreters is the one that is most highly developed by now. We have different levels of training and of degrees. Now, we're looking to applying kind of the same approach to other areas other than humanitarian interpreting, although we often come back to the same learners who are, you know, who've already developed good skills uh, in interpreting, so good listening skills, good language skills, etc. And we're trying to encourage them, okay, is there another area that you would be interested in? And many of them are. If not, you know, we also obviously recruit other refugee learners who have the necessary credentials in order to access higher education. But all of the programs that we develop and all the areas in which we're working all proceed on a similar model. We get an entry level, usually a massive open online course or some open educational resource. We provide uh, that particular learning opportunity to a select number, usually no more than 20 refugee learners. We make sure that uh, those materials are either bilingual or uh, that we have tutors online that can provide the necessary language and cultural interface because it's not just always a language problem. It's also a problem of intellectual cultures, the learning cultures. And once they have successfully, you know, walked through that kind of a course, uh, we would offer them an exam at the end that would entitle them to, you know, obtaining academic credit for it. And once they have actually learned through such an open educational resource, not only to use the Internet, so we don't offer IT courses or ICT courses, we believe, well, you learn by doing, and you learn because you're interested in the material. And if you're interested in the material, you're going to have to learn how to access, you know, online resources. You have, you're going to have to learn how to use the Internet. So this, it's all kind of packaged into uh, the kind of motivation that we would like learners to uh, develop and to maintain. So once they've gone through a massive open online course like that or an open educational resource, we then begin to channel them into degree options where we're saying, okay, here is how you can build a degree incrementally. We insist on multiple exit points because we know that the humanitarian context is extremely volatile. Uh, we don't know when they're going to be resettled. We don't know when they you know, will be repatriated or they want to voluntarily return, take the situation in the doubt. 
we don't really know uh, at what point they will exit higher education because they have, you know, per chance obtained a work permit in the host country and they will obviously, you know, have to earn their living. So we never know when a refugee learner will enter or exit. And so what we have learned is that rather than offering a four-year degree option, we offer multiple exit points. It's a building block approach which allows them, you know, to exit whenever they want, but also to re-enter whenever they want. Hmm. I'm excited about this program. And you, as you've said, you know, demand seems to be increasing. So what's the next three, four years look like for you? What are you presenting about today at the conference? And you know, what's the future vision for InZone and how it continues to evolve? I think what we would like to do for the next three or four years is really validate the model of open educational spaces and higher education spaces in conflict settings. Because we believe that, you know, by bringing together the whole understanding of space and uh, where learning takes place, uh, both from starting at the very formal level, let's say in a computer lab or in a classroom, in a refugee camp, all the way to the home by introducing informal places where refugees can meet, can discuss, can debate, like the coffee shops that we have installed in Kakuma Refugee Camp, by really designing and further refining this whole model of a higher education space that we're able to also encourage what we call reverse innovation, uh, meaning would that not also be a model uh, that could be used in the West and in the North? Is it only for humanitarian settings that this model would be applicable? So for the next two or three years, it's for us really all about implementing the model uh, and making sure that we gather enough data to validate it. And our validation is really much more focused on the scientific validation and a little less on the more traditional uh, monitoring and evaluation. For us, the monitoring and evaluation cycles are way too short. You can't scientifically validate, you know, within eight, nine months because you're so worried about, you know, when the next budget is going to come in and you have to provide, you know, the report so that you can actually get your, uh, your funding. We really feel that that produces a kind of narrow minded thinking where your vision is kind of narrowed down. It's almost like a tunnel vision because all you need to look at is your indicators and, you know, the data that you're going to be gathering and the kind of, you know, assessment that you're going to provide. We feel that by giving ourselves more time, by building incrementally, we're keeping our vision open. We're always on the lookout, you know, for new models and new approaches uh, to how people you know, can learn better, uh, how technology uh, mediates learning, you know, what's new out there. It doesn't mean that we immediately adopt it, but at least, you know, we are keeping our vision open. And I think that is really, you know, how higher education and the mission of higher education in general differs from, you know, primary and secondary education, and perhaps just, you know, in general, uh, from humanitarian action. And I think that's what really I find so exciting about coming at this from a university perspective, Mm -hmm. and also kind of showing to the world, hey, universities can leave their ivory tower. We can be (laughs) smack in the middle of a refugee camp, and we can actually, you know, become humanitarian actors. And yes, we are responsible. And yes, you know, we've learned our lessons. And you know, we're not going to make this a research lab. But at the same time, we feel, yeah, a good dose of scientific validation is really essential. It may be counter to any kind of idea that we have about the emergency concept in humanitarian action. But I think even in an emergency, I mean, we have protracted emergencies emergencies. You know, the DAPs lasted for over 20 years already. I was just going to say, uh, yeah, and, and Syria is, you know, what, but Syria is going the now? same way, yeah. and the refugee camps aren't going to go away. I think this, that it's wishful thinking, but if we can tear the walls down of these refugee camps and just make them regular cities, which they already are in many ways, I think higher education can really kind of foster that kind of thinking about, so what can you do with a camp? You know, Can you develop a higher education space? Well, if you can develop a space like that, so what's next? You know, why can't we just now forget about the walls and, hey, this is actually a regular economy already. What you're saying makes complete sense to me and makes complete sense to many of the people uh, listening to the podcast. But 
So how do you fund this? It, does this longer term view fly in the face of you know perhaps traditional donor funding and usual funding streams for this? Is this an initiative put on by your by your university and you're funding it through that stream, or how does this work so that you don't have to come back with those periodic reports and that sort of traditional monitoring evaluation framework? Yes, I think we've been extraordinarily lucky in the sense that, yeah, the University of Geneva is a university which prides itself in being in the humanitarian capital of the world. So that in itself, you know, gives the university a certain mission and a certain vision, the close collaboration with international organizations and just being, you know, where the Red Cross movement, uh, you know, originated. So that in itself provided a very good framework for us to develop slowly. And, you know, without the real pressures of having to prove ourselves every five months. Uh, However, uh, you know, at this point uh, in zone two, as, you know, we're expanding and as the demand for what we do is, you know, skyrocketing given the extraordinary refugee crisis and migration crisis that, you know, we, we are witnessing globally. At this point, we obviously also need to go out and find the funding. Uh, to fund our activities and to fund, you know, the different models. However, I think while this is not all straightforward and while I believe that our approach, you know, of the multilingual, the multicultural, the incremental, the, the you know, theory-inspired uh, development of these higher education spaces is not necessarily what every funding agency would be interested in. We're in conversations with a number of funding agencies now who actually believe that they've seen quite a few of the more traditional approaches and they've also seen that those traditional approaches are not necessarily sustainable and that if you want to build sustainability you can't do that in eight month cycles uh, mm. so, sustainability, so yeah, sustainability is, is a long range yeah, it's sus- a long range process well, yeah. yeah sustainability isn't necessarily planable it's something right. that we've discovered on this podcast or you know, over the career that I've had is that we try so hard to plan and put put a plan in for sustainability when actually sustainability is what we now call either resilience or adaptability or you know continued evolution would you agree with that in your program totally and that really is also the essence of expertise theory we don't like routine expertise and the japanese have developed this very interesting What's concept. routine expertise? Just to, so, so routine expertise. A routine expert is somebody, you know, who you could throw routine problems at and he or she will solve them very rapidly, very reliably, no questions asked. But the moment you put these experts into a challenging situation that breaks away from the routine, those are experts who actually fall flat on their face that- because they don't know how to solve it. And because their training has been on solving routine problems. Would you, so, would you consider that, so that's like, an, not trying to play favorites, but, but an engineer or someone, you know, a, a government, you know, in a, in a government position who's, you know, faced with a fairly narrow band of problems on a regular basis. But then if you take that same person and take them out of their home or, you know, kick them out of their country, is that, is that the kind of, am I characterizing that correctly? That's right. That's right. And the moment, you know, you leave the tried and true solutions, you, you're actually at sea. You don't really know. Uh, you don't have a compass. You don't know how to navigate. And that is really the result often of a particular type of learning culture, of learning, you know, how to solve routine problems reliably. I'm not saying that that isn't important. It is important. But in order to really, really look at uh, or develop sustainability and build that into your project, uh, you're going to have to be adaptable. And to be adaptable means, yeah, you have, to go out, you have to go out of your comfort zone. And I think the link that hasn't really been looked at carefully enough, although UNHCR has been looking at this for quite some time now, but uh, the very fact that refugees have been taken out of their comfort zone and that they've had to adapt, they, they continue to adapt, really allows them uh, to be open enough to embrace 
this kind of adaptive thinking, this kind of, hey, you know, there, there's no routine solution for this. I'm going to have to find a better way of doing this. I'm going to have to adapt. Yes, we call this resilience. Uh, and I think that's a concept we're actually going to look at together with Idraq, which is an Arabic MOOC provider. And it's part of our very big and very ambitious initiative of building a higher education space in the Azraq refugee camp now. It's, you know, how do you define resilience? Uh, what is resilience seen from a refugee perspective? What can we learn from refugees about resilience? And how can that inform us in the North about building better emergency response procedures? So we're kind of uh, reversing the tables and saying, hey, we can actually learn from these people. We haven't really listened to them. We come back to We've got to listen to people. We've got to understand them. If we don't speak their language, then we're never going to really find out what uh, moves them and what allows them uh, to actually be as resilient as they are. And I have no idea if this is an appropriate question, but are you able to look in the past, especially, you know, we, we're, you're focusing on refugee situations, you're focusing on displaced people, you know, the movement of people. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking the Holocaust. I'm thinking other, you know, during the world wars or, or, you know, in the past when we have some evidence and some literature that's come out of those events to talk about people's resilience, to talk about how they've adapted or how those, are you able to use that and apply that in some way? Yes, there's part, part of it is historical knowledge. And actually it's one of the first initiatives as part of our Azraq higher education space. The first initiative is actually part of the Princeton-Geneva Partnership uh, project, which uh, we just got funded. And it will be a massive open online course that Jeremy Adelman is uh, running on global history. And he's rescripting it uh, to focus on uh, migration and statelessness uh, in the course of history. So indeed, uh, we're going to take a group of Princeton students who are taking the course as a regular distribution requirement. We're having a group of students in Kakuma refugee camp taking the course as well online. We're going to have a group of students in Azraq refugee camp taking the course online at the same time and a group in Amman. And all these student groups are going to be working together in teams looking at the history of forced migration and statelessness and yes indeed also focusing on well what made for resilience you know how did these people solve those problems and how did they overcome adversity so yes indeed you know we're scripting this into our higher education initiatives because we believe it is it is important that we look at history well at the same time i think it is basically essential that we get everyone to take a kind of a more distanced look at what has happened to them, to reflect, uh, to be metacognitive, as I you know, would describe it uh, from a cognitive psychology point of view, uh, to be metacognitive and to critically question how we have done something. Even if it was successful, is it really successful in the long run? Is it just a short-lived solution? Is that sustainable or do I need to adapt again? So that, to me, is really where higher education can make a big difference. And it's, it's a luxury, I agree. But if I believe, you know, if funding agencies are beginning to come around to the idea that, yes, you've got to invest in that luxury, uh, because this is ultimately what's going to uh, mediate sustainability, then I think InZone will have made a small contribution to the edifice. So let me ask you a two-part question. InZone itself is a disruption in the, just the way that we're delivering higher education, obviously, and, and particularly in refugee zone, or in conflict zones with refugees, etc. What disruptions and innovations have informed you? Or what, what disruptions have either enabled or been setbacks for, for how InZone works? Is it, and I'm just thinking mobile technologies, I'm thinking the advent of tablets, something like that. Have, have any of these been either levers that you've been able to, to use or have been setbacks for you? I would certainly say that, you know, technology has played a very important role, but perhaps not as important as one might think. 
because I think what we quickly discovered is that while technology might be quite reliable in the north, it certainly still is not reliable in the global south. You know, your generator breaks down, your solar system breaks down, uh, many things break down in environments that are extremely harsh, uh, are dusty, or you know, where maintenance is just not you know what you would expect it to be in other in, in other places. So we've right from very early on looked at technology not as the driver of what we do, but as an enabler. And by taking a somewhat critical look at technology, we've been able to build our model on different pillars. I would maintain that the most important pillar continues to be learning how to learn. You know, what are optimal ways of learning for people in those contexts? Are those optimal ways different from, you know, how people learn in other contexts? Uh, what kinds of uh, adjustments do we need to make? And at what point uh, do we need to rely uh, exclusively on technology? And if we do, do we have kind of a fallback uh, position? And so by developing models that way, we never rely exclusively on the technology, but we look at new technologi technological developments very carefully. For example, right now, you know, I'm very carefully analyzing Raspberry Pi. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself a lot of questions about, is that what I'm going to try out, you know, in Kakuma refugee camp? The model that we developed there I mean, the technology that we've installed there has not been sustainable. The one in Dadaab has been sustainable, surprisingly, but mm -hmm. not in Kakuma. Although we thought, you know, we had installed the very same kind of technology, but in the end, it wasn't exactly the same. So now I'm looking at Raspberry Pi very carefully. My main criterion has been, is it refugee maintainable? What kind of fallback position uh, do I need to develop? Who needs to come in to fix it? Uh, I don't want anyone to come in and fix it. I want this to be really uh, a refugee-owned technology that they themselves can maintain. Well, in order to be able to do that, I also need to think about, well, what kind of training do they need? And who's going to provide that training? Is that us? Or, you know, with whom do we need to partner to make sure that they have this kind of training? So you can see new technologies and new solutions need to be looked at very carefully, but always against the backdrop of does it meet our criteria of refugee empowerment, of refugee-driven uh, development, because that's the only way it's going to be sustainable. Mm. You've talked about reverse innovation, you know, taking these models that we learn in refugee camps and then maybe bringing them back and applying them in Geneva or some other, other place. Talk to me a little bit about how that relates to something like InZone becoming the standard. You know, I can see right now in my mind, you've talked a lot about MOOCs, massive online open courses. This is something that's being employed in all, all over the Western world, even in higher university settings. Um, online learning is clearly a, a pathway that is being employed by higher education all over the globe. Do you see a convergence where rather than, than end zone being the exception, but being the norm in the, in the near future? Well, in a way, I would hope that we would never become the norm because once you are a norm, you become rather inflexible. And I would always hope, you know, that we continue to be the adaptive experts, to be true, you know. To well the, played, well played, sorry. I, I, don't, I don't hearing. want to make you old and stodgy <laughs> yeah, already. <laughs> but do, you so, see where, do you see where I'm going? I mean, like, at what no, point, I, is I there a way that you question, could, yeah. Yeah, is there a way that you could, yeah, that, that you could become sort of a standardized, a standard model for how we deliver higher education in these settings, I guess? What I would really, you know, hope that we would be able to showcase is, I hate to use the term innovative because I, I, I have, you know, a feeling it's being overused, but we would like to become a source of design thinking in spaces that are, yes, inherently challenging, that, you know, people would take some of our ideas and develop them further, uh, you know, get inspired, uh, you know, not be afraid, uh, you know, to be bold in the sense that, uh, you put together ideas and, and, and theories and models that have already been, you know, validated scientifically, but you put them together in ways that they haven't been put together yet. You implement them in spaces where they haven't been implemented yet. 
you know, just remain motivated uh, to continue to improve and to strive for excellence. I think that would be our hope, that we are an inspiration to others, while at the same time, you know, we continue to work very hard uh, at validating the the models that we're developing. Mm. Two more quick questions for you. First of all, who do you pay attention to in your space? Um, you know, this is blogs, personalities, podcasts, publications about the the trends and the movements in in, in what you're doing. Uh, it varies because being informed as we are by you know our expertise, theory thinking, our pedagogical design thinking uh, about the collaborative learning and the socio constructivist uh, movements that we've carried into the virtual space. Uh, obviously, we're looking at all of these theories and what's coming out, you know, scientifically, uh, the kind of new models that are being developed there. So there's a multitude of disciplinary orientations that we we follow. So not your traditional humanitarian innovators, but, you know, going into the humanitarian, you know, space, uh, yeah, people like Kleinschmidt, for example, inspire me. I, I think he has no... I mean, he's highly experienced. He has seen a lot of things. He, you know, he's gone a lot of places. He's tried a lot of things, and he is very outspoken about, you know, what he believes needs to be done, or you know, and then he goes and tries it. But it's always against the backdrop of I have a lot of experience, and I'm very confident that even if I'm bold, I am not irresponsible. That's the kind of thinking that really inspires me because. I know, yes, I'm confident about the theories. We've done the science, we've done the research, we know that this works, you know, we we are responsible actors in the humanitarian space. We actually go, you know, to these refugee camps, we've built, you know, higher education spaces there. Uh, We don't just talk about it, we don't just research those spaces. We actually work in them and we work with our refugees. And so I think that's why Kleinschmidt really does inspire me. Uh, I also get inspired by, you know, ideas that really, really question the entire concept of humanitarian action. I mean, a word that I'm trying to avoid as best as I can, and sometimes it's not possible to avoid it altogether, uh, you know, is aid and assistance. I have consistently rebelled against that term because it puts you into a frame of mind that is wrong right from the word go. It really runs counter to anything that InZone would ever do. Because the moment you feel that you are providing assistance and and giving aid or delivering aid, by definition, you're hardly ever listening to those that you work with. Or you don't really work with them. You work for them. And so language is important. And it's not surprising, you know, that we would consider language to be so important. Because it, it does, to some extent, influence the way that we think about and shape the actions that we, uh, that we actually engage in. Mm. Last question is, is there, you know, you're lucky enough to be sitting at an I- ICT for D conference right now. So maybe there's, you could just look around and pick one. But is there an, a particular innovation or process or idea out there that, you know, that's, that's not related to your, your focus area that you're, you kind of geek out on that you're kind of excited about? Yeah, yeah. I do get excited about architecture, not just because my brother is an architect <laughs> who, then, who then turned into an urban planner and then, you know, began to really, really inquire about, you know, the whole social space that, you know, architecture, you know, has to interact with. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about the confluence of architectural thinking and designing of spaces, because to me, uh, it is an extraordinary opportunity to look at higher education in a very, very different light. And I think it it really allows us to embrace what technology mediates these days, the anytime, anywhere learning. But you still need a space in which this learning is going to happen, especially, you know, when it's a humanitarian context. So that's one of the things that really you know, inspires me and where I think, you know, higher education is actually making a good contribution. The other thing I'm really excited about is citizen science. And to me, this is, uh, and we've just been talking about this because uh, in the, we've just returned from the Dab uh, refugee camp where we're going to be rolling out uh, a uh, training program for medical auxiliaries. 
And you know, along the way, since it's going to be a rather ambitious project where we're involving different local universities, um, both in Kenya and in Somalia, my hope would be that the students that are going to be trained in that space will also become citizen scientists. They will be contributing data uh, from their immediate environment that perhaps we can't always go into. Uh, and I, I think that is, is an extraordinary opportunity uh, for refugees, and I think it's an extraordinary opportunity for us uh, to learn more about spaces, to get a better idea, to actually empower our learners to contribute to the making of science. So those are the two things that I am really excited about, and we're trying to build into our end zone model consistently as we evolve. Barbara, thank you so very much for taking time out of the conference today and just out of your busy schedule to talk to us today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. (laughs) 